uh, let, let everyone down. <laughs> um, okay, so this is what I'm going to talk about today, this is my plan. I'm going to try and, I don't think this will take very long to convince you that mathematicians love adjectives, they're always using adjectives. Um, two adjectives that are particularly often used are beautiful and explanatory. I'm going to talk a bit about that. Then I'm going to draw an analogy with human personalities. Um, and then I am going to present an empirical study that Andrew and I did um, about mathematical personalities, draw out some implications for you, and then talk about where this could go next. So, um, so David did, did a similar thing actually, he's put up some quotes from Math Overflow. Here are some, I'm just going to show you some almost randomly chosen quotes to try and convince you that mathematicians like adjectives. So this is our Ravi Vakil, um, who's using these intriguing, intriguing words, actress, <laughs> difficult, terrifying, evil and dangerous. Wow. Um, you don't need to know what these, these mathematical objects are, of course, but you just think about the way that they are being described. Here's another one. Difficult, opaque, powerful, natural, intuitive, clear, obvious, trivial. Okay, lots of adjectives in this informal talk. Um, slick, short, conceptual, pure, perfect. Um, so this is, this is kind of a bit old, right? You know, we have this, this conception of maths as being a very rational um, discipline where everything kind of follows. And that's, when you look at the practice, that's clearly not the case. So I'm just going to show you a very short video from this mathematical ethnographies project done at Bristol, which if you're not familiar with, you should go and have a look. It's kind of fun. So a load of mathematicians were asked, is a mathematical proof beautiful? And here is what it's like, uh, they said. looking at um, to a woman dressed very elegantly, and to another that doesn't look after herself very well. And uh, it's difficult to explain in words, but if you see it, you see it immediately. One of the parts about uh, beautiful proof is that it should be uh, minimalistic, it should be concise, uh, but uh, uh, I guess uh, in, in many cases uh, the proof is also unexpected. But, but I think there is beauty in the sense that, if, particularly if it's a simple uh, proof where you can immediately uh, sort of follow it the first time around, that, that is obviously a very beautiful proof. If a proof runs to a whole book, well, okay, it's approved, but I mean, heck, <laughs> we're going to read a whole book of So that's not beautiful. I went into a classroom recently and explained the proof of Pythagoras' theorem to a group of, of nine-year-olds, and I really did the proof. And it's so exceptionally beautiful. It's an idea that when you see it, you just think, oh, wow. Okay. I think when, when not mathematicians see this um, see this kind of behaviour, they find it very, very odd. Um, and I guess if we're interested in mathematical practice, then we should be characterising this kind of phenomenon. Okay? This is the kind of stuff we should be able to explain and give an account of. Um, so I just want to pick up some of the themes in that video. Um, in particular, the relationship between uh, mathematical beauty and simplicity. So this is Prankeray, and he has this um, this quote where he says that um, the character of beauty and elegance are from things where um, that the mind, without effort, can embrace their totality while realising the detail. So he makes this link between simplicity and beauty. And he's not the only person who does this. Lots and lots of people do this. So here's a tier. Um, elegance is more or less synonymous with simplicity. Okay. So I'm going to come back to that later. Um, so, here's my argument about adjectives again. If you look at the, the, the list of adjectives um, that mathematicians use when characterising mathematical beauty, it's a big long list of words there. Um, and again, um, a paper that they don't think mentioned. Uh, Terry Tao made this claim. He said that the concept of mathematical quality <coughs> is a high dimensional one. Um, so, really, what I'd like to explore today is kind of a bit unsatisfactory. 
percent that's high dimension. We can do better than that. How many dimensions does it have? That's what I like to talk about. Mm -hmm. How many dimensions is, um, does mathematical quality have? Um, that sounds like a crazy question to be asking, I guess, but my answer is four. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this is the question that, of the conference that Brendan wrote. Uh, what do mathematicians mean when they use adjectives such as deep, elegant, explanatory, etc.? Um, so the traditional approach to addressing this question is to ask a philosopher. And that has obviously yielded um, lots of useful insights and so on. But when Andrew came on study league to Loughborough earlier in the year, we sat down and we sort of thought about it. And I suggested, well actually, maybe we can supplement the traditional approach um, with an empirical approach. So the basic gist of the talk um, is that um, this sort of question can be addressed empirically by um, asking social psychologists, or possibly becoming social psychologists. Um, I don't know, it's a framing thing, so maybe I won't be able to convince you that. But hopefully I'll give you some, some evidence that might be a, an appropriate strategy. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk three main accounts of mathematical beauty before I move on to the empirical discussion. Um, so Frank Gray and here and all those people I've mentioned talk about beauty as being as being related to simplicity. Um, Rota talks about beauty as being enlightened, and McAllister has this idea that beauty is related to usefulness. Um, so what, what do philosophers do when they propose these kind of things? They sort of say, well, propose a, a, an account of beauty. If you can understand the proof with minimal effort, then it's beautiful. Someone else comes back with, wow, well, yes, but you know, um, lots of trivial proofs are easy to understand with minimal effort, but aren't beautiful. And you have this sort of back and forth with reference to, possibly with reference to counter examples of various claims. And you can do the same kind of thing um, with the Rotor claim. So Rotor said, well, beauty is just the word that mathematicians give to things that they find in life. Um, so you say, well, mathematicians are really not making with words. They just use this word, but they mean something quite different. Um, and you can again, you can criticise that. So Montano has this criticism to do with saying, well, look, ugliness, that should be the opposite of beauty. Um, then we'd expect that all non-enlightening pieces of maths would be ugly, but that's obviously not the case. You can come up with loads of examples of that. My favourite is least squares regression. It's kind of a bit dull. It's neither ugly nor nor enlightening. It's just sort of there. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> And there's loads of things like that you can come up with. So again, this is sort of back and forth with reference to the counter examples. Um, McAllister has this idea of aesthetic induction brought, brought in from science. Um, and he says something along the lines of, well, if a property or deductive step has been shown to be useful loads of times in the past, um, then people come to regard it as being useful. So a proof with lots of dedu useful deductive steps will be seen as being beautiful. And the diagonal argument, I guess, is a good example of that. That's been used in lots of different contexts um, to great effect. So it comes to be seen as a really beautiful argument. Um, so that's the McAllister idea, roughly speaking. Um, and then you can sort of come up with criticism of that as well. So if you're a mathematician who's ignorant of history, you really shouldn't be able to understand mathematical beauty at all, because you won't really know whether a particular deductive step has been useful. So, um, okay. So I don't want to dwell too much on, on the different uh, theories at this stage. Um, but I'll just quickly do the same kind of thing with explanatory -ness. So when is a mathematical proof said to be explanatory? I'm going to argue there's two main theories from Steiner and Kitcher. Um, what do they say? Well, Steiner says, proofs are explanatory if they turn on a characterising property, which is a property unique to a given entity or structure within a family or domain of such entities or structures. Um, and again, you can do this back and forth business by saying, well, uh, you know, firstly, um, well, they're very hard to identify. You know, what's the characterising property in the proof of Pythagoras' theorem? And there's a big back and forth in the literature, which most of you. Um, 
Um, so Kitsch uh, has this idea, explanatory proofs are unifying, they sort of derive a lot of material from a little, um, and that's to do with the minimization of argument patterns, he says, and again he can be critiqued. So Hefner and Mancoso have this nuclear fly swatter criticism, where he says, well, they say that if you, dis if you apply a powerful technique over and over again um, to solve a really quite trivial problem, that's a you know, that's minimising um, the number of argument patterns, but it's not, probably not going to be seen as, as being particularly explanatory. Okay, so um, that is a very brief introduction. Um, so my question really is, how can you approach this question in a non-philosophical way? Um, so as I've said, that's the sort of standard uh, philosophical method. Might there be another way? So, as just what you could possibly do is convert the question, <coughs> convert the philosophical question into a social psychology question, um, which is a discipline I think not really often thought about in these contexts. I noticed in Brenda's introduction, we talked about psychology and sort of talked about cognition and socio cultural approaches. And of course, there is this big fat discipline in the middle of social psychology, which people often forget about. Um, which has a lot of interesting stuff in it. I told Brendan off for that thought, but he obviously either disagrees or doesn't listen. So I don't know. He's going to listen, okay. Um, okay, so I want to draw an analogy with human personalities. So you can think about the fact that if you think of a person, you can use loads of different adjectives to describe that person. Um, so here's my example. Um, this was. I first did this talk, and I knew David Tall would be in the room. Um, so you might hear someone being described as being talkative, loud, excitable, outgoing, you know, all these things you can, you can characterise an individual as. Um, so an important question for social psychologists is, how many basic ways of characterising a person are there? Okay? How many different dimensions are there on which people vary? Um, and you know, this really does sound like a really tough question, <coughs> but it turns out it's, it's, it's not. Um, the answer's five. There's only five dimensions on which people vary, roughly. Um, what are those dimensions? Well, uh, you may or may not have come across the big five personality traits. It's a really impressive scientific achievement, I think. And the discovery was that there's only five broad dimensions on which a person's personality varies. Um, this was discovered by asking people to think of a person, to give them a long, long list of adjectives, and to say the extent to which each adjective described that person. You can then look at the correlations between these ratings, and you can say, well, if, um, if there are adjectives which are pretty strongly correlated, it's almost always going to go. And in some sense, that's the same characteristic. Um, so, here are the big five. One of the dimensions is openness to experience. And you find out if people are described as inventive, they are almost always also described as curious. And they're not described as consistent. And they're not described as cautious. So that's a single dimension. Um, conscientiousness is another dimension. Extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So again, if you're sensitive, if people think you're sensitive, they also think you're nervous. And they don't think you're secure. And they don't think you're confident. Um, those things are correlated. Is that um, um White American males, Europeans? Well, it's very cross cultural, actually. That's yeah, an important question, yeah. So it has to be validated. I mean, I'll, I'll get onto that in a minute. It's really a very well established um, phenomenon. So there are big five scales in almost every language, and you, you tend to get the same factor structure, regardless of the culture. Um, so, <clears throat> so that's a sort of standard big five um, personality scale, you can go through and you say, yeah, I'm bashful, or I'm not bashful, or whatever. 
And then from that, you can derive a personality profile which has remarkable levels of um, validity, predictive validity. So, big five profiles predict, amongst other things, um, undergraduate maths achievement and behaviour, although no one wants to publish that thing. Um, <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> slightly disappointing. Uh, actually, we found there that um, in that paper that big five profiles seem to be a better predictor, well, are a better predictor than gender. So when people make assertions about gender differences in achievement and behaviour, my, su my suspicion is what they've actually found is personality differences, and personality and gender are confounded. But that's a whole different talk, so I won't go on about that. Um, personality is also about well-being, job performance, sharing, drug consumption, swearing, how often you engage in group conversations, and you know anything you can think of, really. Um, and it's a very well-studied receipt. There's nearly a million and a half papers. Um, which use this. I don't know if that's true, I mean, that's what Google Scholar tells you, but um, I don't quite know what Google Scholar hit is in that context. But never mind, <coughs> but it's well used anyway. So, here's the idea. Prior to the Big Five, which came around in sort of early 90s, the field was stuck with this thing called the Myers Briggs scale, which, if you've been on a sort of corporate training course, you may have seen and regarded as, as farcical. And it is, because someone just essentially made it up. Um, so this is our conjecture. The state of the literature on proof characteristics is essentially analogous to, to how the personality literature was prior to the Big Five. Um, um, okay, so Terry Tower says that it's a high dimensional thing, this mathematical quality, <coughs> but maybe we can work out how many dimensions simply by adopting a similar strategy to the social psychologists. So let's just do that and see what happens. So that's what we did. Um, so we created a list of 80 adjectives, which have often been used to describe mathematical proofs. So each of them has more than 250 hits on Google for whatever the word was, proof and mathematics. Um, and we derived these from a sort of reading of Tao's paper and a thesaurus and various other things. But they are each used to describe mathematical proofs. Um, here they are. So, this is in order of frequency. So, people often talk about definitive proofs. They said that they rarely talk about, they still do talk about disgusting proofs, but not often. <laughs> um, and you can see that's, there are 80 adjectives. Um, I'll just leave them up for a second whilst I go through. Okay, so what did we do? Sorry, one question. The frequency goes which way? Um, down and then, so down, oh. down here and then across. Columns. So, columns. Um, but it's a frequency on Google, you know, so you don't talk about too, too much attention to it. Does that make sense? Okay. okay, so what we did is we got 255 mathematicians to think of a proof they would recently read or refereed and to say how accurately each of these 80 words describe it. And we had 255 American, well, people based in American universities. Um, but we've, re we've since done it with British, Irish, and Australians separately, so it's not a, <coughs> we get essentially the same results. It doesn't appear to be an American thing. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly it's a, it, um, you know, ask people about English words, you do need to hope they speak English. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a cool question, actually, because whether you get the same factor structure in other languages is an issue that would be worth exploring. Anyway, so we've got these people to do this on the internet. <coughs> They've sort of got a thing like this, where down the side were the 80 adjectives, and then they were asked to say how accurately that adjective described the proof that they had chosen. We didn't ask them what the proof was, of course, that was up to them. But we made sure that they kept it the same. Then we did a critical components analysis, which if you're not familiar with, is essentially like finding a, a basis, sort of. It's like finding a, a, a reduced basis where you sort of tolerate a bit of noise. So you want to try and reduce the number of dimensions by allowing a bit of, a bit of noise. So obviously with an 80 dimensional space, you want to reduce that to a manageable number of dimensions, reducing the noise in the minimal way. I don't know if that makes sense. 
And you do that by finding how things correlate. And if you, there's the details, um, if you're interested in that, that's the details of the method we use. And there's two ways you can decide how many dimensions are needed when you do this. Um, both of which in this case said five. Um, so we extracted five dimensions or components. And we found that one of them seemed to be quite different to the others. So one of the components had these sort of nasty words in it. Uh, crude cares and so on. Um, and when we plotted the, the mean ratings, we found that. So here are all the ratings down the bottom. Um, and you can see that component one had a nice sort of variance in the middle of the scale. Component two has this they're very low ratings, and the other three are nice as well. So it seems that component two is really just a measure of sort of non-use. People don't like to think of proofs which are, um, oops. they don't like to think of proof. When you ask managers to think of proof, they don't think of crude colors and shallow ones. It's perhaps not totally surprising. Um, so you can, you can investigate that in a different way. So if you plot the mean rating of each of these items against their loading on component <coughs> 2, how well component 2 describes them, you can get a very, very tight correlation. So component 2 is essentially just a not a proof scale. Um, so basically, as I say, mathematicians tend not to think that mathematical proofs are these bad things. So mathematicians like proofs, I guess is the conclusion of that. Uh, which is perhaps <laughs> not a very exciting conclusion. So I'm just going to ignore component two for the remainder of the talk, but if you get rid of all those words and rerun the PCA, then you get essentially the same factor structure. So they're not particularly important. Okay. So, what are the four components? So this is component one. Um, all of these load above 0.5. So you can think about the loading as sort of a uh, the coefficient in a linear combination. So if they've got a high loading, then that, that component is a strong, is a, really is you know, strongly correlated. So striking, ingenious, inspired, profane, creative, deep, sublime, beautiful. Now apparently some people think that sublimity and beauty are different. Yeah. Um, so that's not the case. At least in our. <laughs> Uh, very, very strongly correlated. It's something beautiful, it's also sublime. Um, so we had a look at that and we sort of thought, well, a nice way of describing all those words is it's sort of to do with aesthetics. So that's what we're calling our first component. Second component dense, difficult, intricate, unpleasant, confusing, tedious, not simple. Um, when I say not simple, what I mean is simple loaded negatively onto that. Um, so we sort of thought, okay, intricacy is a decent description of those, those words. That's our second component. Precise, careful, meticulous, rigorous, accurate, lucid, and clear. <coughs> this is the third component, um, which we just call precision. And the last one, practical, efficient, capable, informative, and useful. Um, which we're calling utility. So the point about when you do a PCA with a very max rotation, the point is these are all foggy. Okay? Um, if something loads very, very highly on that, it won't load highly on those. So these genuinely are four dimensions. Um, okay. So if you accept that method, which is exactly the same method that was used to derive the big five, then you can say with some, you know, if you include inverted commas in the appropriate places, mathematical groups have personalities in some sense, which vary on four dimensions, which are aesthetics, intricacy, precision, and utility. So I just want to come back to beauty and explanatoriness, um, because I suggest that these this has some implications for how we understand those those words. And now there's I mean, I, those of you who were at the last conference, um, I sort of briefly had a rant at the end about research methods. Um, so I'll just have another one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. um, okay, so here, prime break, we'll go back to prime break. He said, well, look, beautiful proofs 
are simple. Okay? And lots of other people have said that as well. Um, so this is the quote from that video. You know, I think there is beauty in a sense, particularly if it's a simple group where you can immediately follow it the first time around. That is obviously a very beautiful proof. And as he has said it as well. It's a very traditional view. Okay. In fact, that's not the case at all. Um, beauty is to do with aesthetics, loaded strongly onto aesthetics. Whereas simple, negatively loaded onto intricacy. And in fact, if you look at the, the first, the, the straightforward correlation between those two things, the correlation is essentially zero. There's no, if a proof is beautiful, it does not mean it's also simple and vice versa. Um, it's not the case that proofs that are beautiful. Simple can mean, um, simple can have two sort of overtones, <coughs> can't it? Um, it can have, um, <coughs> imagine the people getting at, you know, simple and elegant, you know, and elegant proof of that theory. But it, yeah. it can also have kind of, so simple, why you wasted my time with it, sort of thing. You know, yeah. why, did you, why did your supervisor think this was worthy of a PhD? <laughs> yeah. it, it should have been an exercise in the end of the chapter. Do you, do, you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, okay. I, yeah, I think that's right. Um, so I would suggest, I mean, so what this does is it looks at how the words are used in the community. Mm. Now, yeah. maybe people are not using it in the same way Frank Gray suggested. I've actually, I, I, thought, I don't think that's right. I think there's another explanation which accounts for this better than that. But I accept that that's a problem. But, you know, if we're going to start using words in a different way to how people use them, I mean, what are we doing? That's a bit old, right? No, I'm, um, sorry, I'm just, yeah. I'm just speculating. Yeah. You know, it's like the, the transatlantic different distinctions of the word nice, which is yeah. being something different. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's an important point. So what we're doing here is we're looking at how words are used in the mathematical community. Um, now, Frank Gray may not be using it in the same way, certainly. But I think, well, um, so that's, that's the plot of the correlation between beauty and simplicity. And you can see there's absolutely no relationship there at all. They're just independent things. So well, why, why is it? So the question is why might mathematicians with such vigour claim that beautiful proofs are simple? Now, that's one account. I don't really, well, maybe, you know, see what other people think. But here's another account. So, you won't be familiar with this paper, um, unless you're a devotee of the British Journal of Psychology from the 70s. But this is a rather nice study, uh, which doesn't seem to have been very influential, um, where they looked at how, uh, what the correlates of memorability are. And basically they find that if something is simple, you're much more likely to remember. Um, so if you, if you ask someone to think of a beautiful proof, the things they're going to call into their mind are going to be the simple ones, because they're much more memorable. Um, so my suggestion is that's a, that's a plausible account for where that relationship comes from. You know, if I just ask you to think of something, you're going to think of all the simple ones. Um, okay, what about other accounts of beauty? So Rosa has this um, beautiful means enlightening suggestion. Uh, that is not impossible, that's quite plausible. So, beautiful and enlightening correlate quite well. They're on the same component, and they correlate at about 0 0.6, which is quite high. Um, however, it's not the best correlate, that's the first thing. So, there are other things that, that are better correlates of beauty. Um, so, it's kind of hard to justify choosing it as a definition. And the critique of that view, um, that not beautiful, um, shouldn't correlate with not in, won't be, isn't the same as not in writing, seems to be valid. So ugly is a poor reverse correlate of enlightening, only around 0.3, but pretty good reverse correlate of beautiful. So ugly is sort of the opposite of beautiful, but not nearly as strongly the opposite of enlightening. Um, so I think that's quite, a, that's quite good for Montano's group, isn't it? What about the, the third account? This idea that beautiful groups are those which have lots of useful steps. Well, we can look at useful and useful. So they load onto different components, and their correlation is pretty not brilliant either. Um, so that seems a sort of far-fetched suggestion. Um, but maybe this is 
Well, certainly at the, at the global proof level, it seems unlikely that usefulness is driving beauty judgments. Um, you'd expect that to be a lot higher. So it's a slightly unfair criticism because um, McAllister's talking about steps in the proof being useful, not the proof itself, which is not what we are. So maybe there's some difference between proof with lots of useful steps. Maybe they're not necessarily useful. Um, so that might be a bit of an unfair thing to say about McAllister. Uh, what about explanatoriness? So, both standard accounts of explanatoriness both give this single characterization of what counts as an explanatory proof. It doesn't kind of matter from either what that characterization is, but they give a single characterization. 